creation of the traditional harvesting poster was started on a project called Understanding Our Food Systems Project. So that was a partnership between the Indigenous Food Circle and the Health Unit, as well as Lakehead University. So we went and had partnerships with 14 First Nations communities in and around Lake Superior and Lake Nipigon and created food sovereignty visions for communities, determining what food they needed and what support they needed to help in being sovereign with their food. So the more sovereign you are, the less food insecure your community is gonna be. So some communities, you know, focus more on, on berries that's in their area. Some have wild rice, some focus on, um, you know, wild game and, and moose. So it was really a uh, place based on what the community needed and what was growing in their area. So as a professor who is focusing on researching and teaching uh, about equitable and sustainable food systems. I'm really interested in the way that some of ideas around this are practiced and, and shared. Uh, and today, you know, most of the food that we eat uh, and have access to is controlled by large corporations and really caters to dominant cultural groups uh, and, and, and those who can, can add to the profits. As a result, uh, the food systems uh, make Black, Indigenous, people of color, quite vulnerable to issues of food insecurity. People don't have access to the kinds of foods that are part of their traditional diet. The traditional harvesting poster represents to me a spirit of reclamation and reciprocity. Reclamation because of the ancestral teachings of the Anishinaabe people around Lake Superior and Lake Nipigon, and how we harvested foods in different moons uh, to plan and prep for all of the seasons in the future. Through the development of the poster, we were able to really reclaim for ourselves some of these ancestral teachings that were lost from us. To our people, food was sacred, and the moons guided how we harvested, processed, and worked with these foods through the moons and the seasons. We would tell stories and songs and do cultural practices around each moon and each food that we were harvesting. And food harvesting was central to our governance systems. And the 13 moons are one of the depictions of that governance system. So I'm really excited about the uh, 13 moons harvest resource as a way to demonstrate what an indigenous food system can look like. I think the project itself and the creation of the resource was really uh, demonstrating what food sovereignty is. It involved learning from and listening to elders, to knowledge keepers, and then sharing a lot of that information back with the communities. So I'm really excited to be able to use this uh, resource in my own work, in my teaching, with some of the communities I work with, uh, and also to continue to learn from it as, as we move forward. Uh, and as well, I've been really honored and I feel very lucky to have been part of this project and to learn so much from all the people who helped put it together. The poster was created in collaboration with four elders, as well as um, I was attending a language class at the time, so as I was gaining knowledge from the elder uh, there and the knowledge keepers present, as well as I had researched online and got some knowledge from, from online resources as well. So compiling all of, that, um, all of the teachings together and then uh, collectively deciding which moon was gonna be represented. So wanting to focus more on what food and what teachings around food each moon was. And looking at place space, like this poster is very place space. So what is here for the moons is could differ in, in a community an hour or two away from Thunder Bay. Uh, and everyone has their own teachings too in this, but that was pretty much the inception the traditional harvesting resource, it really symbolizes the collaboration that has happened as part of the Understanding Our Food Systems project. And the really exciting and cool thing is that it, it shows what a self-determined and sovereign food system would look like and how, how it's impacted by the current food landscape, as we put it, and how things could change potentially in the future to impact uh, Indigenous food systems. My name is Gene Nalgizic. Uh, 
My Anishinaabe name is Little Bear, and I'm from the Bear Clan, and I'm from Kyakazagin and uh, Lake Nibigan. I'm from this area, uh, Robin's Superior Treaty area. Today, uh, I want to talk about the January Spirit Moon, Nunkodad and Gizes, Anishinaabe, and Spirit is the bear. Namko, namko means means the 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 bear goes into his uh, unconscious state during that time. In the midst of winter, the bear turns to his side. The female, anyway, have you know getting prepared to have his babies. That period of January is always warm for about two weeks for that to happen. What that means is that the spirit, the bear spirit, that's what the people around that time celebrate. They go as a community to feast. Each, each family would do that, invite the, their traditional food, whether it's rabbit, moose meat, and wild berries that were collected in the fall and help out the families to, to, to celebrate, you know, and the feast to make sure that everybody gets to, gets to eat during the winter. So that's the spirit moon. Katkoateshing Jesus. February moon is short because the moon travels right in the middle of the earth. So that that's the time the people travel at night, especially in the ice and, and snow, eh? Even though it's a harsh winter, but still we were, they were able to hunt and trap and, and they're still catching rabbits and partridge and and uh, and use the rest of the wild berries that were picked. You know, and food is always abundant. You know, people, you know, save their food, you know, for these uh, celebrations. March is uh, still a lot of snow, but in March it starts to develop uh, uh, heavy ice crust on, 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 on top of the snow. When I was a kid, I used to travel on, on top of that snow. I could walk without snowshoes. That month also provide good hunting for for larger animals, you know, because they they're able to to track them and and track them down, especially the moose and the deer, you know, because they at that time the moose barely moves, you know, because of the, the crust hurts their shins eh, when they walk on the ice. But also the the hunting, the muskrats and and par partridges and, and uh, marten and mink. Also, you can't, you know, you can't snowshoe on top of that crust. It, it files down the hide and that you're, that you're with the webbing, eh, on the snowshoe, and then it eventually just falls apart. Some people do, and they just, make new webbing from the mooses, eh? In March, the food, still uh, moose and, and uh, deer and and, uh, and partridge and, and rabbit and, and um, fish. And, you know, there's there's also ice fishing that, that goes with that, you know. And, and a lot of times people uh, hunt for, uh, you know, in the maven, you know, skunaven, red suckers, and then just suckers. And that's February. So thank you very much for listening. Sugar bush moon. Sisi Bakwat can duck geeses. It talks about Sisi Bakwat is sugar, and it's like a 
when you have brown sugar and you put it in a pile, it moves. And that's Sisi Bakwet. So from that, we've made, uh, learned to make maple syrup and maple syrup candy and stuff like that. It's just still one of my best sweets. It takes uh, like about 20, 20 gallons to make one gallon of uh, syrup. So it's a, a lot of effort. It's about a six to eight week, maybe four, depending when the syrup runs and when it ends. Um, so we go by nature's timeline, not ours. It's not something we can put on a calendar, say from this date to this date. Uh, we look at uh, the trees and the buds on there are still closed and frozen. It's not springtime yet. But when they start to swell and open up and the geese and ducks come back and the waterfowl, uh, nights are not so frosty as they used to be, warms up during the day. Then we might say, you know, spring is coming and Zaguan is here. So we um, always look at the nature, the signs of nature and budding out when the buds go poof, that, that's a good sign that nature's here because they don't shrink again after once they've opened. All of us tribes basically look to the, um, you know, to nature and the moons to name our 13 moons. The Gregorian calendar from Europe is 12 months and different days, number of days, whereas ours is 13 moons, uh, 28 days. And we use the turtle as uh, sort of where the calendar is. So there are 13 segments on a turtle's shell on his back and you go around. And on the outside, there are 28 minor segments, one for each day. Looking at nature, uh, we don't control it, we follow it. It controls us and our move, movements. Um, when to plant, you know, wild rice, uh, when the um, buds and the plants open up and the flowers come out in May. The strawberry, last one to bloom, come out and flower, and the first one to bring forth fruit. Budding out moon, yeah, everybody likes to look at the trees and kind of happy when spring's here. And for most of us, uh, there's a transition between summer and winter. Spring could be a little longer, it could be a little shorter. We can have a cold spring or a wet spring or a hot spring really early. And it impacts and affects uh, summer, the main. Odimen, they're the last ones to bloom, to bring a flower out. And the next month in May, or the flowering moon, the fruit moon, they're the first ones to bring fruit out. And what people don't recognize or understand if you don't understand nature is that there's a certain order to when the berries come. They just don't randomly come out. You start with the strawberry moon, uh, blueberry, raspberry, cranberry, choke cherries, and all, all in order. They never change. So the strawberry moon is really important. It, it is a very nice plant to make. Uh, you can have tea with it, with the leaves and the root for, uh, for a cardiac, uh, mild cardiac med. Bonjour. Payan wapsish wapsishan disnikas mtagami shkunde gana donje makwa tota maski gianini. Hi. Uh, my English name is Jerry Martin or Gerald Martin. Uh, I'm a community elder here in Blender Bay and I come from Mottagamy First Nation over there by Timmins. Um, and I'm semi-retired and I, I like being a community elder, doing teachings with young people in schools. My Christian name is Marlene Sun, and my Anishinaabe name is Bushbudeze Zawazidpwe, and, and that is Brown Buffalo Woman. I'm here to talk about the berry moon. Most of the time, women will go out and gather these berries. We make a ceremony out of it, you know. Uh, we will go pick them together. We'll share information on how we cook them, preserve them. Uh, what we do is we take them home and we wash them up and sometimes we'll preserve them through 
keeping them whole and putting them in bags so we can use them later on. And we'll make jams um, or syrup and we will have them for the winter. The Rising Moon is a really traditional um, process and um, taking care of the rice is honorable. Uh, an uncle of mine, um, Harold Perry, who lives in Ardock, Ontario, is the keeper of the Monoman wild rice and he guards it and makes sure it's safe. When we're ready to harvest the rice, uh, a lot of people will get together, families usually, take out a canoe. One person will be in the back rowing and the other one in the front will have two cedar poles and we'll be taking the rice and um, bringing it into the canoe. The rice is then put out onto tarps and we do that to dry out the husk that's on top of the rice, which is inside the husk. And at nighttime, we'll cover it up in case it rains. And then the next morning, we'll take the tarp off and we'll continue with that same process. On the third day, that's when we'll take the rice and put it onto another tarp or a canvas. So only the women in our area dance. We'll get on our dancing moccasins because you can't dance on bare feet, otherwise you'll be cutting your feet up. So um, there's a special pair of moccasins that we have only for dancing on rice. We don't dance at a powwow on them. They're only for the rice. So we'll dance on that rice for uh, about four hours. And while we're dancing, someone is drumming, usually singing songs and sharing the, the traditional music with us while we're dancing. And it gives us that encouragement. It also puts that heartbeat into us while we're dancing on it. And you can smell that rice. It smells so beautiful. It's such a different smell. I know we have our white rice in boxes. We have brown rice in bags. It's not the same as wild rice. One is manufactured and one is traditional. And the manufactured is gathered up with machines and taken care of by machines. And the um, wild rice is taken care of from gathering to cooking to eating in a traditional manner. So there is a difference. And I would recommend anybody to go out and try it. It's just beautiful. The Changing Leaves Moon how my grandmother explained it to me in a childlike way. She said, when the leaves fall on the ground, their leaves are like a coat. And what Mother Earth does is she puts her coat on for the winter and she's protecting the roots of the trees. She's protecting the roots of our berries. She's protecting the roots of our um, flowers that come back every year. So, that coat covers her and protects her and keeps her warm. So yes, we do get frost in the ground, but we are protected. It's like us putting our winter coat on in the winter. If we didn't have our winter coat on, we would freeze to death. When the trees and the, the leaves change and fall, she's protecting us. So Mother Earth is being protected by those leaves so um, it's not just the changing of the leaves, it's the, the falling leaves. So uh, miigwech for listening, and thank you. Jesus for myself is when the earth returns to its normal self. As far as climate, as far as an environment, this is something we pray for. This is something we strive for, to bring back what was once pure and innocent. So what Benakwe Jesus is when the earth is in tune with the universe. So when the earth tilts, the sun becomes less. 
When the sun becomes less, then the leaves become the beautiful colors that you see in the fall. The rabbit is also something that signifies change. When the earth changes, the animals, and so do we, we begin to start harvesting things that is meant for us to eat. The rabbit will eat the things that help them change, that help them become that white color in the winter as part of protection, but also to become part of the warmth that it needs to survive in the winter. But rabbit can really sustain us because it doesn't have the nutrients and protein that, that may sustain us. So we find different things that can help us through Benakwe Gizas. And along that time, we find deep water fish that come to the shore. The lake trout, speckled trout, all those types of things, because again, like I said, the earth tilts, the earth begins to shift. So when the earth shifts, water begins to shift itself. Just like as humans, we are built of water. So we are in tune with the earth at Ki. And we, when we are able to listen within the mug to the earth, then we are able to see the things that is necessary for us. We're able to walk the shorelines and see the deep water fish along the shore. So we begin to cast, we begin to set our nets. Usually when the earth does tilt, it's letting us know when to prepare for winter. And so does freezing moon. As far as freezing moon, when we start beginning the process of fall, uh, we, we pick up, we, we grab things like manila men, wild rice. And it's during the winter is when we start stocking up on our fall food. So when things start freezing, you'll start noticing frost, you'll start noticing more ice starting to build on the water. And again, like for ourselves, these things help us health-wise. Being a former diabetic, I realized I use the 13 moons to control my diabetes by eating what the 13 moons provide. And as for myself, I've been diabetic free now for five years. So when we start seeing the ice forming, starting to get thick, then we get into a tikumego gizus, white fish. Like I was saying earlier with the lake trout, all those deep water fish, with white fish, there's actually legends to help support a lot of these things we see that, that we know about with the 13 moons. So with the white fish, part of the legend comes around this area right now the sleeping giant. That legend speaks about how the whitefish sustain the people and the nations around this lake by coming to the shore, offering itself. Because at one time, we were hurting, we were having a tough winter. When we are connected to the land, we start understanding that when we see the things that are given, it is not about taking everything. It's about having balance. And the Tikumego with whitefish is the thing that teaches us about balance. We cannot be greedy because those fish won't come to the shoreline again. It's like anything that migrates. When you overkill or when you over harvest, then the land itself will speak to these, these animals, these fish, these birds and they'll find different places of migration or they'll, the fish will go someplace else. So now Mindo Gies is on little, little moon, little, little, little star. It's leap year. As humans, we feel out of place at times. We feel like we don't have a part in life. Just like Mindo and Gies is on. So we feel out of touch, we feel out of place. It's like the leap year. So every four years, this moon appears. It teaches us about
about balance again? Because in life, even for myself at my age, I've learned to become a certain individual because I'm 53, but in my heart, at times, I'm still 18. I run, I play, I fish, I hunt, but this is how I become a part of this community again because I treat my life like a leap year. I find balance, I find help in the community, and through the community, like organizations like Rooster to Harvest and Anishinaabe Food Circle, I find these guidelines in life to help myself in a way where I'm not just giving myself nutrients, but through education, through physical, again, and through, and, and my outcome is my mental. So, little spirit, if you feel that way, be proud of that, because it teaches humility. Don't go beyond what you think is might be right for you. Take baby steps into your own development when it comes to eating. When I was a young child, I still remember my granny telling me, you cannot drink milk anymore. Because our bodies only need milk at a certain period. You don't see bigger cows trying to go after a cow and trying to drink its milk because it's, it, that growth is done. So it's up to us now to find different things to fulfill us, to help our bones grow. And that's what all these things are for. It's find, finding different things to help sustain us, to have a healthier life. Chimir Gretsch, Kinawea. Again, watch God's second name doesn't cause Moko and do then. Jimmy Gretsch. Personally, the THR really represents, you know, the collaboration that has come out of it. From having the elders join us to working with community members to then having the health unit take part um, and other partners such as the Indigenous Food Circle. It's really that relationship building that I think is at the core of this project. Uh, we've built so many good connections and relationships with people. It's re it really serves as the foundation for the project and really helps the project move forward in the future. The work we do with understanding our food systems is based on respectful and collaborative partnerships with the Thunder Bay District Health Unit and 14 First Nation communities. The traditional harvesting resource is both a culminating piece and a foundation for our work in the future. I'm really excited to see where we're going to go in building Indigenous food sovereignty in Northwestern Ontario.